Okay, everybody, welcome to Chapter 15 in Gunstream, where we're going to be dealing with the digestive system. Um, we'll compare the mechanical and chemical processes of digestion and describe the role of digestive enzymes. We'll identify the layers of the alimentary canal and describe the functions of each. We'll compare the deciduous and permanent teeth in the oral cavity. We'll describe the tooth's basic structure. And we'll describe digestion in the mouth. We'll talk about the pharynx and esophagus, their location and their function. We'll talk about the location and function of the stomach and describe what gastric secretions are composed of and what they accomplish. We'll describe the location and function of the pancreas and its secretions and what they accomplish. We'll describe the location and function of the liver and explain how bile is released. We'll describe the digestion process in the small intestine and explain how the end products are absorbed. And we'll describe the structure and function of the large intestine. We'll identify the sources and uses of carbs, lipids, proteins, vitamins, and minerals. ID the three major parts of cellular respiration. And we'll talk about some disorders of the digestive system to finish up. So, why do we need to eat. I know that sounds like a dumb question, but it's actually one that we need to answer if we're going to examine the structure and function of the digestive system. The reason that we need to eat is that the macronutrients we consume, carbs, proteins, lipids, are full of chemical potential energy. And we need that chemical potential energy in order to make useful energy for the cell in the form of ATP so that tissues can function, so that organs can function, so that organ systems can operate and keep you alive. So that's the bottom line. And the digestion system's job is to turn those macronutrients into chemically simple building blocks that can be absorbed into the bloodstream and then be transported from there to the liver, which will then either store that material for later use as fat or as glycogen, or pass it on to the rest of the body in the blood so that the cells and the tissues can take it up and use it to generate ATP in the process of metabolism. The food we eat is too big to be directly passed into the blood. It simply will not absorb. So we have to mechanically and chemically break those macromolecules down into simple building blocks and that's what's accomplished by the digestive system. A series of mechanical and chemical operations We'll reduce complex carbohydrates into monosaccharides. We'll break down proteins into amino acids. And we'll break down lipids into uh, diatriglycerides. The carbohydrates and the proteins will enter the blood directly, while the lipids and the other fat-soluble compounds will enter a special structure called a lacteal and be transported via the lymphatic system. Ultimately, back to the circulatory system and from there to the liver where it will either be stored or passed on to the body to use as fuel or structural components. So that's what the digestive system is all about. So it consists of the alimentary canal which is a tube that food passes through and the accessory organs, you can see them here in the oral cavity, the accessory organs are the teeth, the tongues, the lips and the salivary glands. You've got the esophagus, which is a, just a tube that connects the oral cavity to the stomach. The stomach produces gastric secretions that sterilize the food we eat and chemically break it down. Things like pepsin and hydrochloric acid are produced here. It's churned, and that solid, that solid ball of food called a bolus will then be turned into a liquid called chyme, which will pass via the pyloric sphincter into the duodenum, where Three accessory organs will come into play, the liver, which creates bile stored in the gallbladder, which secretes the bile directly into the duodenum, joining the secretions of the pancreas, which are the digestive enzymes that break down the macronutrients, emptying into the duodenum and allowing that to mix with the food that comes from the stomach. We can break down, as we work our way through the small intestine, uh, the macronutrients into small enough chemical compounds that they can be absorbed directly into the bloodstream. Once we absorb all the nutrient content of the food that we eat, it's then passed to the large intestine 
first entering the cecum, then the ascending, transverse, descending, and sigmoid colon, and out the rectum and the anus. And what happens here is that the waste material is utilized by bacteria that live in this part of the gut to produce energy, and what isn't utilized by the bacteria draws water from the surrounding tissues into the large intestine, and that allows the fecal material to be passed out of the body, essentially unused. Digestion involves both mechanical and chemical processes. Mechanical digestion is the physical breakdown of food into smaller pieces, and this allows a greater surface area for digestive enzymes to do their job. And chemical digestion involves the breakdown of macronutrients into small enough components that they can be absorbed either into the bloodstream or into the lymphatic system. And this happens primarily by hydrolytic reactions using water to split large molecules into smaller ones. The enzymes speed up the reaction in order for it to occur more quickly, and this result we're able to meet the body's needs for nutrition. Each digestive enzyme acts on one type of substrate, a food molecule, and speeds up its breakdown. A combination of enzymes, as a result, are required to completely digest all our macronutrients. So we have um, carbohydrases for complex carbohydrates, disaccharases to break down disaccharides, we have proteinases to break down protein, and we have lipases to break down fat. Okay, so they're all designed for their particular macromolecule. So let's start with a basic description of the alimentary canal. It's a muscular tube about nine meters long that runs from the mouth to the anus. Portions are specialized for different digestive functions and it contains a lumen, which is the hollow space through which the food and secretions flow. Okay. Um, essentially, I know it's kind of weird to think about, but if we look at this picture of the digestive system, food that you eat isn't really inside you until it's absorbed into the bloodstream. You're essentially a walking donut. Your body encircles the lumen of the digestive system and um, what enters the bloodstream is what we can utilize for fuel. The waste products, in a sense, are really never inside your body. So I know it's a little odd to think about, but it is, in fact, the case. So you can see the components of the alimentary canal here, the mouth, pharynx, esophagus, stomach, and small and large intestine. So let's take a look at the digestive lining, the components, and their function. The serosa is the outermost layer of the alimentary canal, and it's made up of peritoneum, which is continuous with the peritoneum that lines the abdominal pelvic cavity. Um, remember that the cavities of the body that are not open to the external environment are lined with serous membranes that produce a lubricating fluid that allow the organs to slide over the, each other's surfaces without producing a lot of irritation, inflammation, and scarring. Um, this peritoneum also envelops most of the alimentary canal on its superficial surface. And remember that most of your internal organs are in motion, and as a result, they need lubrication in order to properly function, and that's part of what the peritoneum does. The other thing it does is it, um, it allows the alimentary canal to be stabilized in its position inside the body cavity so that it doesn't twist or kink and as a result impede its function. Okay, so it has a, it has a supporting role and it also has a lubricating role. The muscular layer is beneath the serosa and this is smooth muscle that has layers that differ in the orientation of their fibers in order to coordinate peristalsis. The outer layer is the longitudinal layer which shortens the tube when it contracts and the inner layer is the circular layer that constricts the tube and propels the food forward. So you can see essentially how this might work if we want to propel food through the tube we would shorten the tube initially and then we would squeeze behind the food and push the food into the next segment 
of the intestine or down the alimentary canal. Um, this is all, again, involuntary contraction. Um, this mixes the food with digestive secretions and, of course, forces it through the canal. Now, other layers we need to be concerned with that are deep to the muscular layer are the submucosa, which is between the muscular layer and the mucosa. It contains nerves, lymphatics, blood vessels, and loose connective tissue. And its job is to seal the other tissue layers together, but also to serve as an area where the immune system can intercept and destroy pathogens that might absorb across the lining of the gut that haven't been destroyed by the secretions of the alimentary canal. So the food you eat and the water you drink is not sterile. There are pathogens in it, and some of those pathogens can make it through the lumen and through the mucosal layer and into the submucosal layer, and it's hopefully here that we intercept and destroy that pathogen before it gets a chance to get into the blood. So what you'll find here are granulocytes. You'll also find macrophages and lymphocytes all acting as a team to keep you disease free. The mucosa is the deepest layer of the alimentary canal and it butts the lumen. It's highly folded, contains a simple columnar epithelium with um, microvilli at its surface and the purpose of the microvilli is to increase the surface area of the mucosal layer along with these ridges that are seen as you move along especially the small intestine and also the fact that the intestine itself is folded upon itself inside the abdominal cavity. This is all because there's a lot of transporting and chemical work that needs to be done in a very small volume and so these surface area modifications allow that work to happen effectively in order to get nutrients into the blood supply. Um, otherwise, we would lose a lot of the chemical potential energy in our macronutrients to our fecal material, to our excretions. The functions of the epithelium, uh, it secretes digestive enzymes and mucus. The mucus is there to lubricate the food and protect the lining of the intestine. Um, it folds have uh, the effect of increasing the surface area in the canal so that absorption happens more effectively. The mucosa has different functions in different areas. Um, in some areas it only generates mucus. In the small intestine it produces mucus and enzymes and in some cases it's only there to absorb nutrients. Um, so depending on where we are in the alimentary canal, you're going to see a combination of these. Um, the mucus secreting portion, if it's only mucus, would be found primarily in the large intestine and also in the esophagus. Okay? Um, the mucus and enzymes would be all along the length of the small intestine. And the nutrient absorption um, would be primarily in the small intestine, um, generally in that section known as the jejunum. Okay, so here you'll still have some mucus, but mostly the mucosa is there to absorb nutrients in this region because by this time they've been broken down chemically into components that will load into the blood or into the lymph. How do we push the food along? Well, peristaltic contractions do this. Um, smooth muscle layers generate two types of movement, mixing movements, where alternating rhythmic contractions shorten segments of the tube and mix the food with the secretions of the mucosa, and peristaltic contractions, which propel the food along the canal, and that's essentially what that circular layer uh, of mus smooth muscle is doing, right? Pinching behind the food and pushing it forward. Um, this pushes the food from one end of the alimentary canal all the way to the other. And this takes over the minute you swallow, okay? The, the minute you've finished the voluntary part of digestion, which is sticking the food in your mouth, chewing and swallowing, 
the peristaltic movements take over. This is why you can, say, take a bite out of a Twinkie and then uh, swallow and stand on your head and open your mouth and more often than not the Twinkie will still end up in your stomach because of the peristaltic movements. Okay, the oral cavity is where food is taken in. This is where it's mechanically broken down into small pieces through the act of chewing. And this mixes it with saliva, it comes from the salivary glands. The saliva lubricate the food, but that also contains digestive enzymes such as lingual lipase and salivary amylase that break down fats and starches, respectively. This is where we swallow as well, and it's surrounded by the cheeks, the palate, and the tongue. And one of the things that you'll notice about the oral cavity is that uh, it's got uh, a tongue for manipulating food. It's also important in speech. And we have teeth. The teeth are your tool chest that are designed to break up your macronutrients. And this is the tool chest of an omnivore, which is an organism that should eat in equal parts meat and vegetable material. Okay. Um, you can see that we've got several different types of teeth. We've got flat incisors in the front, canines on the edges here and here, premolars and molars, okay, on both the upper and the lower jaw. The incisors are for chopping, the canines are for slashing and tearing, and the molars and premolars are for grinding and crushing. And so this is a perfect set of tools to eat both meat and vegetable material. If you look at the dentition of a carnivore or an herbivore, you get a very different picture. For instance, if you look at a dog skull, you see some incisors, although they're relatively small, you see a lot of canines for slashing and tearing, and just a few molars in the back for chewing. And this is a dentition designed for meat only. Okay? In addition, the digestive system of a carnivore is relatively short. For a herbivore, you get a very different appearance in the dentition. You have incisors, a lot of incisors in the front and a lot of molars in the back, no canines. And this is a dentition that's perfect for vegetable material. In an herbivore you'll also find a much longer digestive system designed to get nutrients out of plant material which is a more mechanically and chemically intensive process than getting nutrients out of meat. Here you can see the oral cavity from the side. This is the nasal cavity atop it and the hard and soft palate that separate the oral from nasal cavity. You can see here the tongue, okay, and the oral cavity bounded um, by the soft and hard palate, by the cheeks on the lateral margins, and by the tongue on the inferior margin. The separation of the nasal and oral cavity is critical. Uh, if we don't have separation of these two chambers, when you drink or eat, you can force food into the nasal cavity and it could potentially end up in the trachea or in the larynx. In fact, there's a disease that produces this condition known as cleft palate, where the hard palate fails to fuse at midline, and as a result, food and water can be pushed into the nasal cavity when you attempt to digest. So it has to be corrected with cranial facial surgery. Behind the oral cavity are the layer the, the three sections of the throat, the nasopharynx behind the nose, the oropharynx behind the mouth, and the laryngeopharynx behind the larynx. When you swallow, what happens is that the, the larynx will elevate, the epiglottis will shut over the glottis, <coughs> and then food will be propelled from the pharynx into the esophagus, which you can see here. <coughs> if this doesn't happen, you'll take food into the wrong pipe, and the result will be a coughing fit. As you know, it's quite unpleasant. <coughs> you can also see the hyoid bone here, which is an attachment for neck and tongue muscles and also um, allows or permits uh, the depression actions in chewing as a result of the muscles that are attached to the mandible and the hyoid. Okay. The cheeks lie in the buccal region on the lateral walls of the mouth. The outer surface is skin and the inner surface is stratified squamous epithelia. Between the layers is muscle, again skeletal muscle, that produce facial expression. The lips surrounding the mouth open and form the anterior surface. 
Um, and again, they're highly sensitive and highly mobile. The cheeks along with the lips and the tongue and the teeth are critical in speech. The palate separates the oral cavity from the nasal cavity. It's made up of two sections. There's an anterior hard palate that's made up of the palatine processes of the maxilla in the two -thirds, anterior two-thirds of the hard palate and the palatine bones in the posterior third. The soft palate lacks bony support and terminates in the uvula on its back edge, which is sensitive to touch. It causes the soft palate to move upward when it swallows, and it closes off the nasal cavity and directs food downward. Okay? So very important, again, that we don't get food or liquid into the respiratory system. The tongue is on the floor of the oral cavity. It's skeletal muscle covered by mucous membrane and held in place on the floor of the oral cavity by the lingual frenulum that limits posterior movement of the tongue and also keeps you from swallowing the tongue. Papillae are the rough surfaces on the anterior surface of the tongue, um, I should say superior surface of the tongue, that um, aids in manipulation of food. They also contain the taste buds which provide our sense of flavor. Other tongue functions include moving the food during chewing, mixing the food with saliva, and pushing the food into the pharynx, the throat. The teeth are tools used to mechanically digest the food that you eat. Accessory structures are involved in mastication, which is the act of chewing. Humans make two sets of teeth, the deciduous teeth, which fall out um, towards the end of childhood, and the permanent teeth, which are the second set of adult teeth. You have 32 permanent teeth, and you only have 20 deciduous teeth. The deciduous teeth erupt through the gums at six months, the incisors coming in first and the second molars last. They're lost in the same order that they're formed, okay? So you lose the incisors first and the molars last. The growth of an adult tooth reabsorbs the root of the deciduous tooth and pushes it out of the jaw normally. The permanent teeth appear at from age six months to adulthood, the last set erupting usually in your early 20s. Those are your third molars. The first molars appear first. All the permanent teeth are present usually by age 16. The third molar is showing up between age 17 and 21. They often need to be surgically removed because they'll come in horizontally instead of vertically and cause malocclusion as they crimp the teeth in the jawline. So the way that that's done is that we will uh, make an appointment with an oral surgeon and then they'll apply anesthetic and then while you're unconscious they will cut through the gums and they will use the dental equivalent of pliers in order to pull the third molars out of the jaw. And then when you recover they'll provide you a, um, an analgesic, often Percocet, in order to kill the pain and they'll recommend that you keep that area cool and compressed in order to reduce swelling and speed healing. There are leftover, the third molars, of a time when we had a much bigger oral cavity and a diet that had a much higher fiber and bone content. The oral cavity shrunk quicker than the teeth disappeared but it is a trait that's gradually disappearing from the human population as not all individuals are born with four third molars. Other types of permanent teeth include the incisors, which are there for chopping, the cuspids, which are for slashing, and the bicuspids and the molars, which are there for grinding. The tooth has the following anatomy. As you can see here, there's a crown, a neck, and a root. And at the crown and the neck, we meet the gingiva, okay? And the crown is covered with the hardest known biological substance, enamel. And this is resistant to decay, although it does 
sometimes harbor bacteria that can secrete acids that can eat their way through the enamel and into the softer dentin underneath. Um, but notice that the neck and the root are not bounded by enamel. Um, they simply have cementum around their, their superficial surface and they're held in place by periodontal lip ligaments forming a gonfosis type of fibrous joint. Um, in some individuals that don't have good dental hygiene, what can happen is that the um, bacteria that live in your mouth can form plaque on the enamel, especially in the gingival sulcus. This can cause the gums to inflame and recede, and this can result in bacteria getting up and under the enamel, going through the dentin and all the way to the root canal and the pulp cavity, which contain nerves and blood vessels, and that represents a distinct possibility for infection. So this is one of the reasons why it's always recommended when you brush your teeth, not only to clean the enamel, but to floss, and also to exercise the gums in order to avoid gingivitis, which can lead to periodontal disease. The root is embedded in the socket in the alveolar bone of the jaw. The attachment of the root to the jaw is via periodontal ligaments and cementum. And so you can see here, again, that this portion of the tooth, the root, is relatively vulnerable. Okay. The dentin is the bulk of the tooth, and it is bone-like, but it's considerably softer than enamel, which is the hardest substance in the body, which resists abrasion that's caused by chewing. The pulp cavity is the central portion, and it contains blood vessels and nerves that enter through the root canal. This is one of the reasons we worry about cavities and periodontal disease is we don't want bacteria to get into the root or into the pulp cavity where they can get into the bloodstream and cause sepsis. Um, another important thing to point out about uh, the structure of the teeth when they do become infected by bacteria that cause dental caries, the dentist has to probe the tooth for soft areas in the enamel. And when he finds them, um, you make an appointment to do a drill and fill, which is essentially using a mechanical device, a drill, to remove the infected part of the tooth and also some of the healthy material. He'll then disinfect the cavity and then cover it with an amalgam that forms a seal to prevent infection. Um, the problem with this, if it's repeated too many times, is it can weaken the structure of the tooth to the point where the tooth can actually fall out of the jaw. So it's always recommended, again, that you brush at least twice daily and floss as well. The more often you do it, the better off you're going to be. The salivary glands are also located in the oral cavity and secrete saliva into the mouth. They're activated by the presence of food in the mouth or thinking about food. What does it do? It binds food particles together, it lubricates and dissolves the food, it cleans and lubricates the mouth, and it starts carbohydrate and fat digestion and aids in our sense of taste. Salivary glands are located in different parts of the oral cavity. The parotids are the largest salivary gland, and they're in front of each ear over the masseter and secrete an amylase-rich saliva that helps digest starch. They deliver it near the upper second molar. The submandibulars are located on the floor of the mouth and secrete a watery saliva that has little mucus, and they dump their secretions near the lingual frenulum, the piece of tissue that connects the tongue to the floor of the mouth. And the sublingual glands are located in the floor of the mouth under the tongue. They're the smallest, and they mostly secrete mucus and deliver their saliva directly under the tongue. And so you can see where they're all located here. There's your parotids there's your sublinguals, and there's your submandibular. Again, the name will tell you something about the structure, right? Sub means beneath, sublingual, lingual means the tongue, so under the tongue is sublingual, submandibular, under the mandible, etc. You may have heard of a condition known as mumps, which is a viral infection of the salivary glands causing them to swell and produce pressure and tremendous pain. Uh, it's a childhood disease that's largely been eradicated as a result of an effective vaccine, um, but it is something to keep an eye on. You don't want to contract mumps as an adult because it can lead to 
um, all kinds of complications such as sterility. Okay, what's saliva made out of? Well, it's almost 99% water. Helps dissolve stuff that is polar or charged in the food that you eat. Mucus binds the food together doing chewing and swallowing and lubricates it so it can pass easily through the alimentary canal. And the salivary amylase allows us to digest the starch that's in the food that we eat, turning it into maltose, which will eventually be turned into glucose when it's acted on by the enzyme maltase, which is in the lining of the small intestine. Lysozyme helps to weaken sugar linkages in the bacterial cell walls that cause the bacteria when they experience an osmotic shock to rupture and die. It's a component of saliva, tears, and it's also to some degree found in sweat. Okay, in the mouth we engage both in mechanical and chemical digestion. Mostly mechanical though. Mastication is the act of chewing. It's facilitated by muscles like the digastric, the masseter, and the temporal muscle. This increases the surface area of the food particles. This mixes it with saliva so that it can more effectively digest, chemically digest, the food in your mouth. Chemical digestion is facilitated by amylase and lingual lipase, which digest starch and fats, respectively. The action of the enzyme ends when it hits the stomach, and the low pH causes those enzymes to denature to the point where they can't facilitate any further chemical digestion of starch or of fat. However, at that point, as we're going to find out, gastric secretions take over and we begin in earnest to break down proteins and peptides using pepsin and hydrochloric acid. The pharynx is your throat. It's a passageway that connects the oral cavity to the esophagus as well as the larynx transports food from the mouth to the esophagus when you swallow. The swallowing reflex is where we push food into the pharynx utilizing the tongue. The soft palate contracts upwards blocking off the nasal cavity and directing food into the pharynx. The larynx moves upward and closes the entrance to the main airway and directs food into the esophagus. And this is all designed to keep food and water out of the respiratory system. The esophagus is a muscular tube that runs from the throat to the stomach. It uses peristalsis to push the food towards the stomach. Esophageal mucosa produces mucus that lubricates the food so it easily passes into the stomach. The lower esophageal sphincter, which you can see right here, is the doorway into the stomach. It guards the junction of the stomach and esophagus and is constricted normally in order to prevent regurgitation of the stomach contents into the esophagus where it would produce irritation, inflammation, and scarring. Sometimes this sphincter becomes defective and the result is gastroesophageal reflux disease where you erode the lining of the esophagus causing it to thicken and bleed and the result can be difficulty in getting food into the stomach. It can often result in emesis or hematemesis, right? Throwing up or throwing up blood. Um, the fix for this often is to reduce body weight. Um, this is a condition that's exacerbated by obesity. Um, there are also medications that reduce acid production in order to reduce the effects of the disease. Proton pump inhibitors are an example. The stomach is a J-shaped pouch that lies in the upper left abdominal quadrant it's for temporary food storage and the mixing of food with gastric juice and also begins protein digestion. The stomach is an amazing organ in that it allows us, allows us to do something that we, we truly take for granted, which is engaging in discontinuous feeding. Um, as a temporary food storage compartment, we can eat a meal and swallow it and then go about our activities of daily living. If we didn't have a stomach, we would be eating constantly in order to get enough nutrients into the body to keep us alive. There are organisms that lack a stomach that essentially do this. An earthworm is a perfect example of an organism that has no stomach and the life of an earthworm is basically to eat dirt, to produce waste, and to reproduce. Um, relatively monotonous. So thank your stomach 
um, it's a pretty important little organ. It has several subdivisions. The cardiac region is called that because it's near the heart. It gets food from the esophagus. The fundus is the domed upper region, often filled with gas. It's a temporary storage area for food and liquid. The body is the largest region between the fundus and the pylorus, and the pylorus is the narrowed region that empties through the pyloric sphincter into the duodenum, which is the first part of the small intestine. There are ridges along the interior of the stomach known as rugae, and they are there to increase surface area. When the stomach stretches out, the rugae disappear, and when the stomach shrinks, the rugae become more prominent. The stomach is also perfectly designed to contain its gastric secretions. Hydrochloric acid is extremely caustic. It would eat a hole through your skin if you got it on you. Um, and so the stomach is designed to resist the effects of its own secretions by producing an alkaline mucus that protects the gastric mucosa and also by generating um, a layer of cells that has a high mitotic index that constantly replace the um, layers of the stomach near the lumen that are digested along with the, the gastric secretions on a daily basis. So occasionally what can happen is that we can interfere with the function of the gastric mucosa. An example is a condition known as gastric ulcers which are caused largely by infection by Helicobacter pylori which is a ubiquitous bacteria that hitches a ride on the liquids you drink and the food that you eat it attaches to the gastric mucosa of the stomach and inflames the gastric mucosa. Um, this causes um, irritation and inflammation of the region colonized by the bacteria and that along with the action of the gastric secretions can cause the gastric mucosa to bleed. So we call that a bleeding ulcer in the event that the ulcer is so bad that it goes all the way through the stomach wall we call that a perforated ulcer, and that's a medical emergency that requires surgical intervention. Um, very interesting that not everybody gets um, gastric ulcers. It's uh, got a genetic component to it. Essentially, not all gastric mucosal linings are created equally. The bacteria will stick to some linings and not to others, and as a result, only a small percentage of the population is susceptible. The pyloric sphincter is the doorway out of the stomach, and it's at the junction of the stomach and duodenum. It's constricted um, in order to keep food from passing into the duodenum until it's processed into chyme. Um, it relaxes to allow the food passing into the duodenum to encounter the secretions of the pancreas, gallbladder, and liver, um, and it does so in a series of squirts that come seconds before the ejection of bile and pancreatic juice into the duodenum. The stomach is lined by a thick mucous membrane that protects it from its own corrosive secretions and the folds, the rugae we've already spoken about. And here you can see the gastric glands in the gastric mucosa. They open at gastric pits and you can see here deep down inside the organ um, the area that's responsible for regenerating the gastric mucosa. Um, there are parietal cells that are responsible for producing hydrochloric acid <coughs> and chief cells which generate pepsinogen which is an inactive protease that once it hits the low pH in the stomach lumen turns into a powerful proteolytic enzyme that breaks down the protein in the food that you eat. Um, it doesn't completely digest it, however, because it only recognizes certain amino acid sequences. The job of completing protein digestion occurs in the small intestine via pancreatic enzymes and enzymes that are in the lining of the, uh, the mucosa of the jejunum and the ileum, as well as the duodenum. Gastric juice is produced by the gastric glands. The cells near the opening generate the mucus that protects the, um, the gastric mucosa. Uh, the chief cells are at the bottom of the glands and they secrete pepsin, pepsinogen and the parietal cells generate the hydrochloric acid 
the combined action of the chief cells, the parietal cell secretions, and the churning action of the stomach turns the bolus of wet food into chyme that will be squirted into the duodenum by periodic, periodically opening the pyloric sphincter so that it can um, allow those contents to mix with the pancreatic secretions in the bile. How is gastric juice secretion controlled? Well, gastric juice is constantly produced, but the secretion increases when food is on its way to the stomach. Examples of stimuli that increase gastric secretion include the sight, smell, or thought of food, food in the mouth or the stomach. Parasympathetic impulses increase with, <coughs> with food stimuli, <clears throat> and this directly stimulates the gastric glands to increase secretion. This causes the stomach cells to produce gastrin, um, which is a hormone that stimulates gastric gland secretion. And you can see, again, how this is all interrelated. Um, you start with parasympathetic preganglionic nerve fibers from the vagus nerve innervating the stomach. Um, this leads to parasympathetic postganglionic impulses stimulating the release of gastric juice from the gastric mucosa. <coughs> the impulses then secrete, or and, I'm sorry, the impulses then um, promote the release of gastrin carried in the blood back to the stomach which causes the release of more gastric juice and this all ends of course when the stomach empties okay uh, once that occurs um, the change in pH along with the fact that the stomach is no longer distended causes this entire loop to shut down okay or at least uh, slow considerably Parasympathetic impulses decrease in frequency when the stomach empties. This decreases gastric juice secretion. The intestinal mucosa generates hormones in response to the presence of chyme, which include cholecystokinin and secretin, which also decrease gastric juice secretion while at the same time promoting the contraction of the gallbladder and the release of pancreatic juice. So essentially, when we look at the digestive system, the operating principle is always to inhibit behind and stimulate ahead of where the food is. And here's a perfect example of that. So once the food's been treated by the stomach, it's a liquid that is going to have to be neutralized because the pH is very low. And then chemical digestion and mixing will have to be continued. And that's what happens in the small intestine. Hydrochloric acid activates pepsin in the stomach, which breaks down protein and inhibits bacterial growth. Um, the pepsin is also activated when it comes into contact with the low pH uh, and begins protein digestion. Okay, so the hydrochloric acid acts both as a sterilant and as an environment in which the pepsin can do its job. In fact, if you tried to use pepsin to digest protein at a neutral pH, you would find that it doesn't do a very effective job of breaking down protein. So it's, it's specifically designed to work at that pH. Renin curdles milk protein, keeping it in the stomach longer and allowing the protein to be more easily digested. Intrinsic factor is very important. This allows vitamin B12 to be absorbed across the gastric mucosa and into the bloodstream. Um, if we lack intrinsic factor, a condition known as pernicious anemia can result where we have a problem producing red blood cells since B12 is required for DNA synthesis, which is critical for the initial stages of hematopoiesis. The stomach absorbs water, minerals, and alcohol as well as hydrophobic compounds, such as many drugs, but most of the work of absorption of nutrients is in the small intestine, and that's what comes up next. So as the chyme is introduced into the first part of the small intestine, which is the duodenum, two other accessory organs are going to be 
induced to secrete, and those are the gallbladder and the pancreas. The pancreas is behind the stomach, in between the duodenum and the spleen on the lateral margin. What it does is it secretes pancreatic juice, which uh, has its release control by a sphincter called the sphincter of Odi, or hepatopancreatic sphincter, which responds to cholecystokinin and secretin, as well as as a result of autonomic stimulation. The pancreatic duct joins the common bile duct, which runs all the way to the, the, the gallbladder. This enters the duodenum. The hepatopancreatic sphincter then opens just prior to the food coming from the stomach through the pyloric sphincter and produces an environment in which the hydrochloric acid coming from the stomach will be neutralized by the bicarbonate that's generated in the pancreas, which is part of the pancreatic juice. And also, this will facilitate chemical digestion of the chyme via pancreatic enzymes working in concert with bile. The job of the bile is to emulsify the fat that's in the chyme so that we produce a greater surface area upon which the lipase can act. Um, the job of pancreatic enzymes is to chemically break down the macronutrients into small enough components that the enzymes in the lining of the small intestine can finish the job of generating monosaccharides, amino acids, and fatty acids and glycerol. So here you can see the exocrine function of the pancreas. You can see here that the digestive enzyme secreting cells dump directly into the pancreatic duct which joins the bile duct to empty into the duodenum as the sphincter of Odi opens. Okay? But the pancreas is also an endocrine organ as we found out in the endocrine chapter um, the hormones insulin and glucagon are there to regulate blood glucose levels. Insulin is designed to reduce blood glucose levels while glucagon is designed to elevate them. And this is one of the ways we keep a constant amount of sugar in the bloodstream so that the cells have a source of fuel to produce ATP so that they can continue to perform life function. How do we control pancreatic secretion? Well, hormonally and neurally. Um, neural control is via parasympathetic impulses that stimulate the pancreas to generate pancreatic juice. And hormonal control is through secretin and cholecystokinin. The secretin is released by the intestine in response to acid chyme getting into the, into the duodenum. And this causes the pancreas to generate the juice this neutralizes the chyme because the bicarbonate that's in the juice will react with the hydrochloric acid and the pH will go back to neutral. Choleocystokinin is secreted by the intestines in response to fat in the chyme and it stimulates secretions from the pancreas that are rich in digestive enzymes such as lipase. It also stimulates the gallbladder to squeeze and release bile into the duodenum at the same time. Okay? So those are the two critical hormones. So here you can see how it works. The acidic chyme enters the duodenum. The intestinal mucosa releases secretin into the blood. The secretin is carried back to the pancreas causing it to generate pancreatic juice which contains bicarbonate ions that will neutralize the hydrochloric acid and reduce the damage to the duodenum. It's very important that we do this because if we didn't have bicarbonate in the duodenum ahead of when the chyme came in, the result would be damage to the duodenum and the production of a duodenal ulcer. And this sometimes happens. So keep in mind that the only organ designed to contain gastric secretion in its native state, low pH, is the stomach. And if it gets outside there, we either have to neutralize it or it'll cause a lot of damage. This is why the esophagus can be easily damaged by um, reflux 
and also why the duodenum can be damaged by chyme in the event that the pancreas doesn't properly secrete uh, or the stomach at empties too rapidly. Okay, what are the pancreatic enzymes? Well, pancreatic amylase breaks starch into glycogen and, and uh, starch and glycogen into maltose. Starch and glycogen are both glucose polymers. The difference between the two is that starch is a plant product and glycogen is found in animal tissue, but they're both composed of glucose chains. Maltose is the glucose disaccharide that will then be chemically broken down into just glucose monomers by maltase. Pancreatic lipase breaks fats into monoglycerides and fatty acids. These molecules are then absorbed across the lining of the small intestine and into the lacteals. Trypsin breaks proteins into ever smaller peptides. It is it's capable of cleaving a different amino acid sequence than pepsin. Okay, so what happens here when protein passes through the stomach and into the intestine is that we're breaking down the proteins into smaller and smaller polypeptides. Um, eventually, um, carboxypeptidase and um, other enzymes that act at the amino terminus, aminopeptidase, will produce single amino acids that will be absorbed directly into the bloodstream. And those are in the mucosa of the small intestine. Okay, the liver is the largest internal organ, weighs about 1.4 kilograms. It's in the upper right quadrant, protected by the ribs. It's dark reddish brown, and it has many, many, many functions. In fact, if you lose your liver, you lose your life. Okay, this is why the first four letters of liver are L I V E, to live. So, what does it do? Well, it makes bile. It has a role in carbohydrate release into the blood and carbohydrate storage in the form of glycogen. It has a role in lipid recycling, okay, so it can both um, reform lipids and secrete lipids into the bloodstream. It has a role in protein digestion. Um, it detoxifies poisons and harmful chemicals. It removes worn out blood cells and it stores fat, glycogen, and iron and vitamins, it makes blood proteins, and it converts fat into sugars and glycogen into simple sugars. So very important as the body's kitchen and pantry in that sense. Okay, So a lot of things that are done by the liver. The liver has got four lobes, a very large right lobe and a smaller left lobe, and then a caudate and a quadrate lobe on the back side. The hepatic artery brings oxygenated blood into the liver, while the hepatic portal vein brings nutrient-rich blood into the back of the liver through an area called the portia hepatis. Um, the hepatic vein draws blood from the inferior drains blood from into the inferior vena cava. Um, so essentially what happens when you eat is that the nutrient-rich blood goes via the hepatic portal vein directly into the liver and then the liver will take those nutrients and either store them for later use in the form of fat or glycogen or pass them back into the hepatic vein and into the inferior vena cava for the body to use as fuel. Okay, So that's its role as your body's kitchen and pantry. Right, working there. Um, liver tissue is very unusual looking. Uh, it's arranged, arranged into lobes that have a central vein and at the vertex of uh, the tissue that surrounds the central vein, which is hexagonal, are three vessels. Okay, You've got a bile ductule, a branch of the hepatic artery, and a branch of the hepatic portal vein. And so what happens in these sinusoids that are inside the liver is that the oxygenated deoxygenated blood mix and then the hepatocytes chemically treat the blood without ever coming into physical contact with the formed elements. Okay, So this is one of the reasons why the liver has immune privilege. Um, the sinusoids are lined with cells that do not allow an interaction between the lymphocytes, macrophages, and the hepatocytes. So this is why if you need a new liver all you have to do is match blood type and not have a tissue match. 
bile is collected into the hepatic duct. The duct, the hepatic duct and cystic duct form from the gallbladder joined to form the common bile duct, which carries the bile towards the pancreatic duct. The two fuse and then empty into the duodenum, going through the hepatopancreatic sphincter. Okay. Um, you can see here the right and left lobe, and you can also see back here the quadrate and the caudate lobes. The gallbladder stores the bile between meals and concentrates it about 200 fold so that it's a better fat emulsifier. Um, sometimes people have to have their gallbladder removed and the result is difficulty with a high fat diet because the bile produced isn't nearly as concentrated. Um, sometimes the bile in the gallbladder sits so long that it crystallizes, forming gallstones, and this produces a, a searing pain when the stomach empties, uh, as if lit cigarettes were um, were in your abdomen. Okay, best best description that I know how to describe it. Bile is a yellow greenish liquid. It's got water, bile salts, and pigments, as well as cholesterol and minerals. Bilirubin is the breakdown product of hemoglobin that gives it its green color. And the purpose of the bile salts is to emulsify lipids into chyme so that the lipase more effectively breaks down the lipid that's in the chyme. It also aids in the absorption of fatty acids, cholesterol, and fat-soluble vitamins by the intestine by, again, increasing surface area. Um, here you can see how bile release is controlled. When the intestine is empty, the hepatopancreatic sphincter is closed up and forces bile into the gallbladder where it becomes concentrated. But if there's fat in the duodenum, cholecystokinin causes the gallbladder to squeeze. At the same time, it causes relaxation of the hepatopancreatic sphincter and the release of the contents into the first section of the small intestine just ahead of the chyme. And the result then is the mixing of the chyme with the bile, the emulsification of the fat, and then the lipase, which is in the pancreatic secretions, will finish the chemical digestion of the lipids. The small intestine is about seven meters long and an inch wide begins at the pyloric sphincter and ends at the large intestine uh, at the hepato, or I'm sorry, at the ileocecal valve. It's the site of digestion and absorption of nutrients, and you can see here the three segments, the duodenum, which is the first and shortest sec section, the jejunum, which is the long middle section, and the ileum, which is the last and longest section that connects to the large intestine. It's suspended by mesentery from the body wall, and um, its job is to absorb nutrients. If we look at the lining of the small intestine, the mucosa has finger-like extensions called villi lined with columnar epithelium, which contain microvilli. Both of these modifications are designed to increase surface area. The villus anatomy is simple columnar epithelium with a centrally located lacteal, which is a component of the lymphatic system that absorbs fat, and there are capillaries all around it that absorb the amino acids and the sugars, the simple sugars. Intestinal glands secrete mucus and intestinal juice, and microvilli are there to increase the surface area as long, along with folds in the epithelial cell plasma membrane and the epithelial lining. Okay, again, we have to do a lot of absorbing and secreting in this area, so the more surface area modifications we have, the more effective we're going to be at finishing that function. Intestinal juice is alkaline with a lot of water and mucus, and it forms an environment for the action of bile salt and pancreatic enzymes. Its regulation is um, by mechanical stimulation, the presence of the chyme in the intestine activates the secretion of intestinal juice and enzymes. Neural reflexes are due to the stretching of the intestinal wall, 
parasympathetic impulses increase the rate of intestinal secretion just ahead of where the food is located. Some general events of digestion and absorption include vigorous peristaltic contractions that mix the chyme with the bile, the pancreatic juice, and the intestinal juice. This emulsifies the fats and facilitates the chemical digestion of carbs, proteins, and lipids. Absorption of the nutrients into the blood is the result once we've broken down the polysaccharides into monosaccharides, the proteins into amino acids, and the triglycerides into monoglycerides and fatty acids. Intestinal enzymes are used to complete the digestion and the result is that we are able to then load simple sugars into the blood. Um, the disaccharases listed here do that. Um, the lipases finish the processing of fat and load that into the lacteals and the peptidases finish the breakdown of polypeptides into amino acids which are loaded into the blood. Simple sugars get into the lining via active transport and then into the bloodstream. The fats diffuse into the epithelial cells because they're nonpolar so they don't need a special membrane transport protein to go from one side of an intestinal cell to another. The molecules then recombine into fat forming chylomicrons and the chylomicrons then enter the lacteals along with cholesterol and phospholipids and proteins and then eventually they're going to rejoin the circulatory system at the subclavian vein along with the lymph. Okay, So that's how we get the fat eventually back into the bloodstream. Very small fatty acids enter the villi directly without being recombined. And so here you can see an example of how this works. Okay, you've got the fatty acids out here that are the result of the breakdown by lipase of triglycerides. The fatty acids are able to go right through the membrane. Um, they are used to synthesize fats in the ER. Okay, the fats collect in clusters and are combined with proteins. The chylomicrons that form are then um, emptied out of the basal portion of the epithelial cell and then directly into the lacteals which are going to eventually transport them back to the circulatory system. Okay, proteins are broken into amino acids by um, peptidases, proteases. Uh, the amino acids are actively absorbed into the villi capillaries along with water, minerals, and vitamins. The blood leaving the intestines then flows via the hepatic portal vein into the back of the liver and the materials are processed before the blood enters the general circulation. Now once we've done all this, once we've gotten all the nutrients into the blood, what we have left over is food for the bacteria that live in our large intestine and waste products. And this is the job of the large intestine is to deal with this. So the large intestine is a little bit different than the small intestine in that it doesn't have nearly as much surface area or nearly as much smooth muscle. Okay? Um, the ileocecal valve regulates the movement of the chyme from the small intestine into the large. Um, the large intestine is about six and a half centimeters wide and one and a half meters long. It's got three segments, the ascending, transverse, and descending, and sigmoid colon, um, along with the cecum, which is the initial segment. The cecum is the pouch below the ileocecal valve, which is where the small and large intestine join, and there's a section called the appendix, um, which, uh, which protrudes out from the cecum. It was once thought that the appendix was a useless organ, turns out that it is a site for bacteria to recolonize the large intestine in the event they get wiped out. It's also an area where the immune system interacts with pathogens and antigens in our waste products in order to provide an, an efficient defense against disease. But you can live without your appendix. If the appendix becomes blocked 
fecal material with bacteria can produce gas. It could cause the appendix to inflame, and it could potentially rupture. And if it ruptures, we have a disaster because now we have bacteria inside the peritoneal cavity leading to peritonitis, which can lead to septicemia. So if you have an inflamed appendix, the diagnostic for that, again, is uh, tremendous pain at McBurney's point, which is halfway between the navel and the crest of the ilium. If you double over, when the doctor pokes you there, then you probably need to go to the ER and have the inflamed appendix removed. The colon has several parts, right? The ascending, transverse, descending, and sigmoid colon. And then the rectum and the anus are the last part of the large intestine. There you can see the rectum. The short terminal portion connects with the anus, and this is how the waste products exit the body. Um, you notice here that um, you've got uh, blood vessels just below the mucosa. Uh, sometimes these blood vessels can become distended, and we call those hemorrhoids. And hemorrhoids, I know a lot of people laugh about them, but they're no laughing matter. Because of their location, they represent a distinct possibility for infection. So if you suspect that you have hemorrhoidal tissue, you need to see your GP or your proctologist as soon as possible. The anus has mucosa that's folded into anal columns that possess networks of arteries and veins. It's kept closed except during defecation. It's controlled by two different sphincters, the internal anal sphincter, which is controlled by the autonomic nervous system, and the external anal sphincter, which you control, which is made up of skeletal muscle. The tenia coli are longitudinal bands of muscle that run the length of the colon, and when they contract, they form the pouch-like haustra that are indicative of peristalsis in the large intestine. The large intestine is held in place by mesentery, which, again, stabilizes its position so it doesn't twist or kink, and the mucosa have no villi. The epithelia have a lot of goblet cells that produce mucus that lubricates the fecal material so they can easily pass. What does it do? Well, um, the food residue in the large intestine has mostly water, minerals, bacteria, and undigested foodstuffs. Um, the, it serves as a fuel for the bacteria in the gut, but not for our purposes because we don't have the enzymes to break down those waste products. So it just passes through um, undigested, unabsorbed. Um, it doesn't generate any digestive enzymes. The bacteria there break down non-digested food residues and produce byproducts that are useful, such as the B vitamins and vitamin K. They also generate gas. The mucosa produces mucus that lubricates the fecal material so that it can pass more easily. And the main function of the large intestine is the absorption of water from the fecal material as well as vitamins and minerals. But remember, most of the absorption that takes place in the digestive system is not in the stomach, is not in the large intestine, it is in the small intestine. The end product is fecal material. Large amounts of bacteria, mucus, water, and non-digested food residue is found in feces. Mass movements propel the fecal material towards the rectum and the anus. You should undergo these movements two to four times daily, usually following a meal, and this frequently triggers the defecation reflex where the rectum fills with feces and stretches, which triggers contractions that increase the pressure, opening the internal anal sphincter, which causes you to open the external anal sphincter, um, and this allows defecation to commence. If the external anal sphincter is contracted, defecation will not take place. Okay, let's talk a little bit about what it is in your diet that provides the energy for life. There's six groups of nutrients, the carbs, the lipids, the proteins, the vitamins, the minerals, and of course the water. Essential nutrients are ones that we cannot produce, so we have to eat them to get them, and they're needed to make other molecules necessary for life. There are essential amino acids and fatty acids, most vitamins we need to ingest, and as well as the minerals and the water. Okay, so we have to eat that to get it. Okay, 
Um, energy foods are used in cellular respiration to make ATP. That's the useful energy that cells need in order to stay alive. We can't take energy directly from sugars, fats, and proteins and use that to drive cellular function. We have to transfer it to ATP first in order to turn it into an energy form that the cell can immediately use to do things like repair, grow, move, secrete, etc. So where is most of the chemical potential energy in your diet? Well, it's in the carbs, the fats, and the proteins. And it's primarily in the carbon-hydrogen bonds in these molecules. So when we crack those bonds, the energy released is transferred to ATP with the loss of heat as a byproduct. Cellular respiration involves really three processes. Glycolysis, which occurs in the cytoplasm, and then the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain, which occur in the mitochondria. And they require oxygen in order to run. So with oxygen available, we can liberate a lot of chemical potential energy and transfer it to ATP, about 40% on average. The rest lost is heat, which maintains our body temperature. But without oxygen, we can only run glycolysis, and we don't really get very much ATP uh, from just running glycolysis. We get 2 ATP per glucose running glycolysis, and we get 38 when we run all three legs of metabolism. So this is why we have to breathe in order to live. The oxygen in the air that we breathe allows the citric acid cycle and the electron transport chain to run and allows us to produce ATP to keep us alive. So if we look at glucose, when it enters the cell through the membrane, it is going to be passed to the glyco glycolytic pathway the result of this is that two pyruvic acid molecules are going to be produced and a net gain of 2 ATP will be realized. The pyruvates are then converted into acetyl-CoA and passed into the mitochondria where the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain take over. Um, carbon dioxide is released as a result of this transformation. The citric acid cycle that converts acetyl-CoA into carbon dioxide, into protons that are pumped into the intermembrane space of the mitochondria, and into high energy electrons which are used in order to drive a process called um, oxidative phosphorylation. The electron transport chain receives high energy electrons from molecules NADH and FADH2, oxidating those molecules, and then those high energy electrons are passed from membrane carrier to membrane carrier, and the energy that is extracted from those electrons is used to pump protons into the intermembrane space of the mitochondria, and that produces proton gradient that will ultimately be harnessed in order to generate ATP directly as the gradient diffuses through ATP synthase. So we'll see that outlined in just a minute. So this extracts energy from the electrons to make ATP. At the end of the chain, the electrons, the protons, and the oxygen form water, and this yields about 36 to 38 ATP molecules, again, depending on the cell. Cellular respiration has the ability to generate this many molecules from a single glucose. Each product of lipid and protein digestion can also be used in respiration directly or indirectly after conversion into a molecule that can enter one of the three legs of metabolism. And so you can see here how this is set up. Let's just start with the simple pathway first. Carbohydrates are broken down into monosaccharides, which are chemically rearranged into the molecule glucose, which then enters glycolysis with the production of two ATP and the formation of two pyruvic acid molecules. The pyruvic acid is decarboxylated. This is an energy releasing process that allows the formation of ATP. At the same time, we form acetyl-CoA, which enters the citric acid cycle. We produce 
large amounts of carbon dioxide, some ATP directly, very little though, but mostly large amounts of NADH2 or NADH and FADH2, which will eventually be oxidized by the electron transport chain to generate tons of ATP along with water, carbon dioxide, and of course heat. Where do these micronutrients come from? Well, carbs come primarily from plants. Glycogen is found in small amounts in meat. Monosaccharide sugars are found also in honey and fruit, while disaccharides in table sugar and dairy products. Starch is in cereals, vegetables, and legumes. Your RDA for carbs is between 125 and 175 grams, which would be about 60% of your calorie intake daily. Cellulose is a plant product that we can't digest, but which our gut bacteria, E. coli, can. So we call that fiber. And it's a good idea to have a lot of fiber in your diet because it makes you feel full without contributing significantly to calorie content of the food that you eat. It also is thought to prevent conditions such as um, colon cancer. Um, it also aids in the passage of fecal material through the large intestine by adding bulk and adding water content. So this is one of the reasons why we increase our fiber content as we get older because our peristaltic movement in the large intestine slows as we age and so we tend towards constipation. And so if we don't have adequate fiber in the diet, the result is fecal material that gets very difficult to pass. So it's a good idea to get into the high fiber um, habit early in life so that it doesn't come as a surprise later on. Carbs are used mostly as an energy source. Glucose is the primary energy molecule. The liver, using glucagon and insulin to regulate blood glucose levels, allows the glucose to be delivered to the cells as they need it. If we have high blood glucose, insulin is secreted, and that causes the cells to take up sugar from the blood and use it for energy, but it also triggers in the liver the conversion of um, sugar into glycogen and fat. If excess still remains, um, it becomes our adipose tissue. In low blood glucose situations, the liver converts glycogen to glucose, putting that into the blood to allow the cells to use it for energy. If even more is needed, fats are converted into fatty acids and glycerol, which can be converted into glucose directly. Lipids are the most calorie-rich molecule that you eat. Okay, because they contain the most carbon-hydrogen bonds. They can be broken down um, into uh, a couple of categories. Uh, cholesterol is an unusual-looking lipid, which serves as the building block for steroid hormones and bile salts, just to name a couple. Um, but triglycerides are a fuel lipid. They're the most common in the diet. Um, they are used to make phospholipids. Uh, triglycerides come in two forms, saturated and unsaturated. Saturated fats tend to be solids at room temperature, while unsaturated fats tend to be oils. Um, as a result of the presence of these double bonds, unsaturated fats contain fewer calories than their saturated counterparts, and this is one of the reasons why they tell you to increase your unsaturated fat content. Specifically, if you can go for polyunsaturated fats, that's even better versus things like butter and lard. And that's because there's fewer calories in those molecules. Uh, fats and oils are mixtures of saturated, monounsaturated, and polyunsaturated fats. Saturated come primarily from animal products as well as coconut and palm oil. Um, monounsaturated examples include peanut, olive, and canola oil. And polyunsaturated include things like sunflower and corn oil. Cholesterol is found in dairy products, red meats, and egg yolk. The RDA for lipids is 80 to 100 grams, no more than 30% of your total calorie intake. Less than 10% should be saturated. Cholesterol recommended to be no more than 300 milligrams daily. Lipids are critical in the diet. Phospholipids, remember, are a structural component of cell membranes, while fatty acids 
form myelin sheaths. Triglycerides are an energy source, and cholesterol is the starting point for bile salts, steroid hormones, and portions of the plasma membrane. The liver regulates triglyceride and cholesterol levels by producing lipoproteins for lipid transport in the body. There are different types of lipoproteins. The low-density lipoproteins in the chylomicrons are called bad cholesterol. They transport lipids to cells for fatty deposits in places like arterial walls, while high-density lipoproteins are the good cholesterol that carry lipids from dying cells and fatty deposits to the liver for them to be removed. Proteins, uh, prime sources include red meat, poultry, fish, milk, eggs, nuts, cereals, and legumes. Essential amino acids come from uh, these sources. Eight of the 20 amino acids that can't be made by the body are found in these animal products. Essentially, you are what you eat, right? So if you eat meat, you can create meat, and the amino acids are part of that process. It's essential for the production of proteins needed for normal growth and maintenance. The animal proteins, of course, contain all the essential amino acids. Plant proteins don't necessarily contain all the essential amino acids if you're looking at a particular plant. As a result, you have to mix and match your plant sources of protein to get complete protein. An example would be red beans and rice, where they complement each other. What one lacks in an essential amino acid, the other supplies. So you can get complete protein even if you're a vegetarian. Amino acid functions are important, right? They're used to make protein. They're an energy source if you're low on glucose or fat. So the liver removes the amine group, turns them into Krebs cycle intermediates that can be used to generate ATP. The amine groups are used to form ammonia and urea, which is excreted in the urine. Vitamins are organic compounds that facilitate metabolism. They act along with enzymes to allow catabolic and anabolic reactions to proceed. You can think of the vitamins in many cases as tools that the enzymes use in order to carry out their function. They can be classified as either water or fat soluble. The fat soluble vitamins are A, D, E, and K, and they are resistant to heat and not easily destroyed when you cook. The water solubles are the C and the B complex vitamins, and they can be damaged by heat. Minerals are inorganic substances that we get absorbed in the soil by plants. We also get them from animal material. About 4% of our body weight is mineral, 75% calcium and phosphorus. They are part of organic molecules, and they're also ions and body fluids, which do a lot of important things like establish membrane potential and serve as a, a structural component of things like bone, um, just to name a few of their functions. So what are some disorders of the digestive system? Well, they can be grouped as inflammatory or non-inflammatory. An inflammatory disorder would be appendicitis. The appendix becomes inflamed when it gets impacted with fecal material. Um, we have pain in the lower right quadrant. Uh, the treatment is surgical removal. Diverticulitis is the development of sac-like pouches in the colon that act the same way that an appendix can act. Um, it comes from a diet that lacks fiber. It also is a process of aging, um, and inflammation can cause the same kind of pain and bloating that we associate with appendicitis. Hemorrhoids are varicose veins of the anal canal. They can be caused by obesity and pregnancy and chronic constipation, and they represent an infection risk because of their location. Periodontal disease is an inflammation of the gums, usually caused by um, gingivitis, which is where bacterial plaque builds up in the gingival sulcus and causes inflammation in the region that abuts the crown and the neck of the tooth. Um, the problem with periodontal disease is that the gums can recede and expose the teeth to a bacterial infection because remember that the area below the crown has no enamel and the result can be um, essentially infection of the cementum and the dentin and uh, we can get bacteria into the root canal and the pulp cavity. Um, 
This can cause loss of teeth. It also presents a distinct possibility for sepsis. It's caused by poor dental hygiene. Hepatitis is an infl inflammation of the liver. It can be caused by viruses and drugs. We see jaundice, which is a yellowing of the skin and the sclera of the eyes, caused as a result of the buildup of bilirubin in these tissues. Uh, pruritus is also noted, itching. Um, we also see fever and hepatomegaly, liver enlargement. Hepatitis A is spread from person to person by contact with fecal material or with fecally contaminated food and water. You have, need four to six weeks to recover. Hep B is spread by transfusions, contaminated needles, saliva, and sexual contact. Most people recover. Some people remain carriers. Hep C um, is spread by person-to-person -person contact of fecal contaminated food or water. Um, symptoms are mild, usually with four to six weeks of recovery. More serious effects occur during the third trimester of pregnancy. Any viral disease represents a risk to pregnancy because the virus is so small it can cross the placenta and get into the baby's bloodstream and affect its development. Peritonitis is an inflammation of the peritoneum that can result from bacteria getting into the peritoneal cavity. A ruptured appendix or um, a ruptured diverticula could be one way that the bacteria could get in. This causes the peritoneum to inflame and the bacteria can get into the blood and then cause septicemia. Cirrhosis is where the liver converts into scar tissue. Um, this can be caused by hepatitis, nutritional problems, liver parasites. The problem, of course, with the liver is that if you lose the liver, you're going to lose your life. Uh, so generally, um, what we try to do there is cut down on whatever it is that led to the, the, the breakdown of the liver. Many cases of cirrhosis are the result of alcohol abuse. Um, essentially, the alcohol that's converted into the liver into um, a, a compound similar to formaldehyde can damage the liver tissue. The result is that you generate non-functional patches of liver and the liver starts to lose function. Um, fortunately, the liver is one of those rare organs that when it's damaged can regrow and regenerate. Um, this is unusual. Most tissue in the body doesn't do that. It generally produces scar tissue which is not functional. Um, so that's uh, a good thing. Another good thing about the liver is that it is immune privileged and so to get a replacement liver you only have to match blood type and not uh, tissue type. Constipation is where we don't have sufficient bulk in the diet so we can generate hard dry feces as a result of staying in the colon too long or lacking enough fiber. Um, the result is that it's very difficult to pass and it can, in some cases, cause um, bleeding of the colon, rectum in the anus. Diarrhea is the production of watery feces, and the risk here is that we can lose water and electrolytes um, and have to replace those. It can be caused by inflammation or stress, and as any number of conditions, it can result in diarrhea. Caries, this is cavities in the teeth is the result of excess acid production by bacteria that live in the oral cavity that digest the food left over after you swallow. Um, the acids can degrade the enamel and even if they get into the under the gum line they can degrade the cementum and the dentin. And the result is that we can eventually get bacterial infection of the pulp cavity or the root canal and that can lead to tooth decay can potentially lead to infection of the blood. Okay, eating disorders are caused by an obsessive concern with body weight. This is a very common condition in young women. Examples include anorexia nervosa and bulimia. Anorexia nervosa is basically consciously starving yourself, resulting in malnutrition. Um, the death often comes due to prolonged starvation. Bulimia is overeating and purging by self-induced vomiting or the use of laxatives. It's associated, again, with fears of being overweight as well as depression and stress, and it can cause electrolyte imbalance, erosion of tooth enamel, and constipation. Gallstones are the crystallization of cholesterol in the bile. This happens in the gallbladder if the bile sits too long. Symptoms include pain and jaundice. The treatment includes shockwave therapy to break up the gallstones or surgical removal 
if the gallstones are too large to be fractured by lithotripsy. Okay, uh, that brings us to the end of this podcast. Again, make sure to review this material as it will be covered on the exam. And I will see everybody in the next podcast.